It's the week two edition of the Coach's Corner here on Ravelry Family Media. Great to have you along with us. Todd Robbins alongside Lumminster head coach Devin Gates. Lumminster coming off of a tough 15-14 waning moments loss on a field goal to Shepherd Hill in week number one. But amazingly, as the schedule would have it, the rivalry has some way of reinvigorating its team coming off of a week one loss as Lumminster will play host to Fitchburg in this COVID modified season in week two, coming up in a matter of days. We'll have more on that as we get through the hour. But first, as we uh, we turn to a, back to week one for a moment, Coach, uh, I, I can't ignore, obviously, some of the, the great things that went on and then obviously some of the things that you'd probably put in the other category, uh, the uh, the places to uh, to build off of. Uh, but the opening drive of the, of the game really felt like, at least in the early part of the football game, it made a big difference. You possessed the ball in the opening, very quickly got your first first down of the season. Running game looked like it was going to hit its stride. Uh, it made a, uh, you know, a, a call to go to that wildcat formation. J.C. Cora was going to take the quarterback spot. The shotgun snap goes sailing over his head. And then the drive seemed like it kind of went kaput, as did maybe the rest of the first quarter. How much did that very first, you know, kind of uh, – toe stub make a big difference in the first quarter of that football game uh sure i mean it put us on a little bit of a hole uh but to, to do that against a, a team like shepherd hill so um you know it was unfortunate that it happened we got it fixed um but yeah i, I mean you, it, it took us a little while to uh you know it, it caused us to have you know the field the, on their end of the field for the better part of the first quarter it was tough getting the ball out of there a little bit but uh, I mean, defense stepped up after that first drive, put them in the bad spot, and, and really held their own, and, uh, and and made it you know so we were able to put the field. Field position was such an important part uh, of how that game developed, at least in the early going of that football game, uh, because obviously once you guys turn it over, they come back and score quickly. You get the ball back, run into a, a fourth down situation, try to punt your way out of that situation only to have the ball not go as far as you'd want a second time around. And so it felt like at least in the early part of, of that football game, the, the early miscue ultimately led to the first six points of the game because the inability obviously for a punt to clear the zone kept them on your half of the field, then followed up with the almost exact same thing on the next drive. Uh, it just seemed like back to back and, and you had alluded to this, maybe being a potential for, you know, a, a trap spot. If you were to have one thing that goes sideways and you weren't able to recover from it, you might spend the bulk of a period of time trying to recover. Uh, but the time and the opportunity did present itself somewhere, somewhere down the line. And, and that time came down six points coming into the waning part of, of that quarter your defense ends up backed up. They're literally just getting shoved steadily back toward their own goal line. And then as time would have it, the quarter expires. You guys have to change ends. You get an opportunity to talk to your defense. I want to know what, what did you say to your defense? What was the overall message to your defense at that moment in time? Because whatever was decided at that moment turned the football game and, and potentially maybe saved that football game in a lot of ways uh, as it could have gone the way of that 2019 game we alluded to but the defense comes back out and defends one half yard not a yard not half a field one half yard and pushes them back and seems like cues you up for the next quarter and a half uh, of football off of that one key defensive stand yeah and, and that's Murphy right there. I just told it, it was, it's gut check time. You know, we could either have this go the way it went last year, or we flip the switch and we, and we, and we, you know, make a stand right here, right now. Uh, and the guys did, and they, they came up. We had, you know, Durkin had a great stop, a great stop, even though I think he was being held. Uh, they stretched it out to the sideline. He had a great stop out there and got him for a loss. Uh, and then we got penetration in the backfield on that fourth down play and it caused disruption in the mesh and the balls on the ground. And, you know, it didn't matter anyway with the fourth, with the fourth down stop, but uh, you know that uh, you know that was really pivotal and kind of giving us you know kind of that you know that shot in the yard that we needed to get back in the thing uh, where it really could have gone south uh, even quicker than it had in the first quarter. And there was a multitude of occasions building from that point where the defense just kept answering the bell, creating opportunities and really pushing for this team to obviously get into the right position to obviously give the offense the chance to build a lead and, and steadily grow. How important was the defense in that second and third quarter in particular? Oh, huge. I, they're, you know, 
the de- your defense drives our team. You know, we everything that we do comes off of our energy on defense. And um, you know, I can't say enough great things about Coach Murphy and what he does. Those guys ready to go, and they're, they're ready to fight for each other, and you know, play for this team uh, the best that they can. And um, you know, it, it really was after this Shepherd Hill game in 2019 where we really started to play, you know, even even better defensively. Um, you know. It, that's you know if you want to look at a silver silver lining for playing Shepherd Hill is that you come out of there a more physical team going forward um, so that's what happened to us in 2019 hoping that that happens now because we really played some physical physical football for that being our first time against a different color jersey for you know in, for a year and a half uh, so we were really pleased with how physical they played they set a tone you know really gave the rest of the team confidence to go out there and execute and uh, you know it, it was just it was really good uh, you know, and that's, you know, that's from our defense and, and what they're able to do with you know, coach Murph told the guys after, um, you know, you may not have that many defensive stops, fourth down stops or goal line stands in a whole season, let alone in a game, uh, you know, for those guys to do it, you know, in many times, uh, you know, it says a lot about the character of our, of our guys. No, uh, no question about that. And when I, I think about that stand and then obviously what it built to successively moving its way through the rest of the ball game. This was, I thought, a key distinctive difference, not just in the Shepherd Hill game in 2019, but in most of your opportunities in 2019, when the defense would create potential space for the offense, the offense never seemed to meet them where they needed to. The offense just never seemed to show up at that moment in time. And it felt like in week one of this season, that was the, the moment where not only was the defense clicking and creating the opportunity, but the offense met them when they gave them the opportunity by and responding with adding points to the board. Yeah. And I, I think that just goes with, you know, not only the confidence thing us that we can go out and take a couple chances offensively to throw the ball down the field. Um, but with the maturation of our, of our offense, this second year in the system. And like, you know, we've really trimmed a lot of, like to do for the shortened season uh, because we want the guys to go out there and execute with confidence. And, um, you know, so we didn't, you know, get crazy with what we're doing and um, you know, it it all goes with with what, you know, Caden can handle at the quarterback position in terms of throwing the football down the field. And um, you know, he made stepped up and made some big plays um, and he's had a great, you know, preseason camp up until, up until game one, too. So, um, you know, a lot of it is his maturation, you know, over the, over the last year and a half uh, and familiarity with everything, but you know, the offense as a whole, their familiarity with everything. I think um, they understand what we're trying to do a more than, you know, just running around. Like they understand how they fit into the whole entire scheme. And it's like we're playing more, um, you know, more heady football on the offensive side and the guys are really starting to get it. Bill Thomas raised this point on the broadcast that you're kind of alluding to, and that is not only the maturation process, but we're six months later than when a high school football season normally would take place. So for a lot of these players, particularly sophomores and juniors, who maybe would have been in one place developmentally had the season been played at the end of the 2020 calendar year, they are six months older six months stronger and potentially six months more developed than they would have been. So it's almost like getting a year and a half of your junior season, as opposed to getting, you know, just a a sophomore and a junior season. Do you see maybe players being a a little more physically developed, a little more mentally developed uh, that maybe that extra six months benefited some players in the long run for as odd as this all may be? Absolutely. We had three, three sophomores start for us, you know, uh, in that game as well. And, you know, even from when the fall, we had a, you know, our, we had our 10 practices in the fall. They've even, you know, matured physically, you know, and mentally as well. Have that time in the fall where we, it's almost like a classroom on the field. We can kind of go over all the stuff that we're doing now. They understand it. Now they've, you know, that they've grown up and, and now they can execute even better than they did. It's pretty exciting. You know, I'm, I'm really happy with the direction that we're heading. Um, you know, we obviously have a lot of work to do with cleaning up a lot of the small details that, you know, can kill drives and, you know, put you, you know, put you in a bad spot. Um, but again, we're, we're growing as a football team. We're heading in the right direction. You know, and I, I see us, you know, getting better every week. 
circle back to week one for a second, but you bring up another point I want to uh, stop on as an aside. Uh, and you mentioned obviously having those 10 practices before the year started in earnest in place of the fall season, and then obviously being able to come back and, and play in the spring. And that is very typical in, in the college schedule in reverse. Usually you have your spring practices and then your spring game, which is just a glorified inner squad scrimmage. Uh, and then you, you come back and you play your season in the fall. And obviously high school sports, the way the schedule is structured, the fact that students are not specializing in theory in one sport, that they have the opportunity to play across a diverse schedule. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't always lend itself to this idea. And of course, out of season coaching is a massive MIAA no no under normal circumstances. And it seems like while at times there's an appetite for that to exist, could you see a place in high school where you could carve out a time? for essentially spring ball, summer ball, uh, an early season opportunity to create some growth in players before you get into the season? I think so. I mean, I'd, I'd love it. I, I mean, some things would have to change, obviously, in terms of the rules. Um, you know, not – I know that in, in college when we had our spring football season, um, season, we had kids, you know, at Division three. you have kids that play other sports too. So we have baseball players that, you know, they're, they're, you know, their priority is baseball. But whenever they can come and make a practice or watch some film or get to a team meeting, they can do that. And, you know, and right now, MIA rules don't allow students to be involved in two sports in the same season. So that would be something that needs to get worked out. You know, and, and again, we want to steal from, you, you know, any of the other sports as well. We want kids, you know, we want kids playing as many sports as possible and staying busy. That's what makes better athletes. You know, the specialization is nothing I've ever really been, you know, in favor of, you know, obviously – during the summer, if you want to see, you know, go to some camps and do something like that, that's fine. But the, the year organization, um, you know, it can cause some robotic type of movements and thinking. And, you know, we, we want kids to be athletes, to go out and have fun, run around. Um, but, you know, to have the opportunity, which most other states who have the federation rules do have spring football. I think Massachusetts is actually the only one. Um, just to learn and grow and to, you know, I, I think it's important to have that too, but I, I understand where the hesitation is, obviously. Certainly, uh, as we saw throughout the, uh, the last calendar year plus, as we've been navigating all of these COVID items and creativity has ruled the day and trying to be able to create the opportunity for athletics to exist. You know, there has been openings to, you know, create some creative solutions to existing problems as well as to problems that were you know, posed because of an international pandemic. Uh, the part that I think for me as a, you know, an observer that I'm most concerned with observing is the idea that some of the conversation now is about going back to the way we always did things. Uh, and, and I feel like we, in losing the creativity that have been established and the way these relationships have worked out, I think that to me would be a tragic, if there was an opportunity to implement some ideas here or some out of season coaching or something that creates an opportunity to make the overall athletic experience better. Uh, I think it would be tragic if we just let that go by the wayside and said, well, that's not the way we did it pre COVID. So we'll yeah. never do that again. No, I absolutely agree. I, I think, you know, for us, you know, even, ha even, you know, MIA allowing some out of season coaching or film meetings or something like that, you know, for me, able, being able to, go to a practice, get the practice back up on, on, on huddle on video, and then have a Google meet with, you know, you know, Caden or, you know, other quarterbacks or the offensive line and be able to do film right here, you know, live on Google meets, you know, when you can't do it in the classroom has been huge. It, 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 all, it, it saves on time. It, you know, it, it, you know, the kids are home and they can you know, still pay attention to it and everything too, but it cuts out the travel time. The kids are working on academics and everything too. So it really, is you know a pretty efficient way to watch film and make sure that you know the kids are uh, you know staying up to up to date with everything that you're doing. Um, so I, it, those are some of the things that I wouldn't have even thought of to thought to do before before COVID. And those are the things that I think you know even you know no matter what happens moving forward, we're going to stick with doing some of that stuff too. But yeah, I, I think it would be tough to lose some of the creativity that we that you know the coaching community has come up with on on, on having to you know to work around some of these hurdles. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's it's produced some more efficient ways to get some stuff done. So uh, I hope that, you know, whoever, you know, whatever ways people have found to do some of these things that they, they stick with it. 
If only they would listen to the coaching community, we would have had a far better solution to the statewide playoff as well. That's another episode that you and I will have on sure. plenty of plenty <laughs> of time to talk about. But if only they listen to the Mass High School Coaches Association. I digress. Let's go back to special teams here in, in week number one, as it certainly proved key on, on both sides. And at, at moments, it was a great benefit and at other times, a, a bit of a curse. Uh, let's talk first about Luke Miller, of course, uh, who won the game ultimately for Shepherd Hill on a field goal. We talked about a little bit before we came on the air. The idea that for a high school, you know, student athlete to be able to run on the field, get set within the play clock, not have to take a timeout, not have to do anything else. Uh, that just felt like one of those circumstances. You just, I mean, they don't happen often in high school sports. So uh, in high school football, to get a kid that can run out, set, kick a field goal, and it's good, kind of hard to be upset with losing a football game in that manner. It's one of those cases you just have to tip your cap to the competition. They won the day by doing and executing what they intended to do. No, they executed it well, and, and their kicker had a lot of poise and got up there and, and nailed it through. And that was a tough spot. You know, it was a tough spot to make that happen. Um, you know, as, as a coaching staff, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they went for two both times they scored. So, you know, we weren't sure how it was going to play out, but we were willing to let it ride out and see where it go for, see where it went from there. But, you know, that you didn't let you know any of that stuff bother him at all. Got out there, got set, kicked it through, and you know, kudos to him. Like you said, you got to tip your hat to him. He he went out there and executed and, and came through for his team. Sometimes that's just the way things break. Your kicker in the meantime, Bill Thomas and I were talking on the broadcast about him being probably, if not the most, at least one of the most improved players that you could markedly identify and go, wow, what a difference a year and a half makes for a student athlete, that being Santee Rodriguez. The leg strength, the poise, the word you used moments ago to refer to Luke Miller, the ability to place his kicks. I thought, although again, I know I hate talking to coaches about this, but when you're talking about the punter and positioning two punts perfectly on the field, it means things aren't going quite the way you want it offensively. So bear with, but those two punts that he was able to not just kick because quite often again high school football it's just they if they could get the snap and kick the ball away that's a great success yeah. the fact that he was able to catch the snap kick the ball in the right way that it would stay low into the wind hit the ground roll out and do it twice in a game to push the other team back I thought showed a lot of growth in a student athlete who was really only in his first game of his second competitive season as a football player yeah, this is only his what his his twelfth football game, <laughs> you know, you know, in his in his career, uh, and I, and I tell you, over the last year and a half, I'm not sure if anybody in the team has worked harder than than Santi has, you know, at at perfecting his craft. Um, you know, he has been absolutely tremendous in his work ethic and the balls that he kicks and working on every other bit of the small details. Um, you know, even. You know, Frank Novak, you know, will still call and check in on him. He, he talks to Frank every week. They can, they with each other too and frank's been great at helping out santi and talking about the little things and it's it's really paid off he's a he's an absolutely wonderful kid um you know it, it, and the whole team you know rallies behind him and, and to see him go out there and succeed especially after having two you know two not so great punts to to start the you know the start the game with to rebound and again have the poise to get the ball down there and, and really pin them deep when we needed them to um, you know, and then nail the extra points too. Uh, it says a lot about Santi's character and, and uh, you know, in, in his work ethic as well too. No loss ultimately ever feels like a good loss, but I've got to imagine given where you were a year ago, if a year and a half ago, if you use it as a measuring stick to where you are today as a football team, there's got to be a lot of energy and a lot of excitement and a lot of positivity flowing through that locker room after that week's performance if ultimately they didn't get the result that they wanted. Yeah. I, I mean, we're, we're a competitive group and, and no, and, and that was probably the most quiet bus ride home I've ever had coaching career. Cause the, the kids know that we were right there and, you know, and that we are better than what we put on the field on, on Friday night, you know, maybe, you know, deeply we played at a very high level offensively. We, we have, you know, a couple more levels to hit. Um, so I, I know that the guys were disappointed overall in our overall execution, but, um, you know, after watching the film and you know, meeting with the guys, you know, over the weekend via Google Meets and then practice today, um, you know, they, they they do realize that they've they they have come a long way. 
you know, in the, in the year and a half since last season, that they, they do know that they've, they have progressed, they have gotten better. They do understand things better. Um, you know, that coupled with having to rebound and get ready to play a rivalry game, you know, that's the perfect medicine to, to get, you know, to get back to work and, 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 to, and to puppy back up. So, you know, I, I told the guys, you know, after we left the, yeah, after we got on the, get off the bus, you know, after uh, that we flipped the switch and that's what we did. And we're all about Fitchburg now. So 15, 14, Lemonster drops a tough one in week one to Shepherd Hill to fall to O and one. Meanwhile, the Rams improved to one and O. We'll take a look at some of the other scores going on around week one here in pod number one. Watch you sit a big win as they sting Shrewsbury by a 19-14 score in that one. Seemingly a, a bit of a surprise in week one action. And then the high scoring affair of them all, Doherty downs Algonquin. A combined 53 points scored in this one. Doherty a 33-20 victory over Algonquin in week one action as well. So when you take a look at the standings in pod number one uh, through one week, you've got three teams with wins. That of course being what you said, Doherty, Shepherd Hill, three teams with losses, Shrewsbury, Algonquin and Lemonster. That's the split across the first week of action uh, in this pod. While we're at it, let's look at the upcoming schedule for Lemonster. And of course, coach alluded to it. Week two action. It's the 139th meeting of Lemonster and Fitchburg coming up on Friday night at Doyle Field. From there, weeks three and four back-to-back tough road tests at Shrewsbury at Wachusett before rounding out the fifth week of the season versus Doherty coming up in April. So that is where we stand as far as schedules go for Lemonster. Let's look at other games as we turn toward week two that we'll be keeping an eye on around this pod schedule. Wachusett will travel to Shepherd Hill in this week two action. As part of the change you saw moments ago on the schedule, Algonquin will now play at Marlboro while Lemonster plays host to Fitchburg in order to allow that game to happen. And in pod one, Shrewsbury, idle this week so that is where everyone stands on the schedule and coach time to turn our attention to the 139th meeting of Lemonster and Fitchburg as you said I mean there is no better medicine in the world to a loss in in a week to then getting to play your rival the very next week uh so certainly helps with uh with focusing all attentions and all energies in one general direction uh this meeting has been about 480 odd ish days coming uh Fitchburg hasn't played yet a football game you all have gotten a chance to play at least one game the last time you two played 480 plus games ago, it was a seven, nothing football game. All of one touchdown came late in the second half. Your team scored it and won the football game by a seven, nothing score. As you turn your attention to this week, knowing limited to not much about what Fitchburg's got available to them, having only seen one performance from your football team in your mind, do you see a a game setting up to look a lot like maybe what we had seen in Thanksgiving, 2019, something that's going to be defensively dominating and offense is going to be via attrition. The team that scores at all is the team that wins the football game. You know, it, it, it's tough to tell. I, I mean, I know that they're a very talented team in terms of their size and their speed, their athleticism, um, you know, and they're going to come in, they're going to come in and get after it. You know, they, they've waited, you know, this is their coming out party here. We had the game last week, you know, this is their chance to get back on the field again, too. Um, you know, our defense performed well this past week and, you, you know, so, you know, all signs point to a, a, a good defensive football game. Um, you know, as an offensive guy, I'm hoping we're able to put up some points, obviously, um, and we're going to do our best and do that the best that we can. Um, but you know, they, they have some talented players over there. We're going to have to be ready for it, too. So, um, I think whatever the game calls for, we'll be ready for. And, um, you know, hopefully that, uh, you know, we go out there and just are able to execute very well on both sides of the ball. Not only, of course, have they not played a football game, but 480 odd days ago, they had, I won't say an entirely different coaching staff, but a significantly different coaching staff than the coaching staff that they have in place right now. Uh, Tom DiGeronimo out as head coach. In comes interim head coach Greg Graham, promoted up off of the existing staff. Uh, you are familiar with Greg Graham. You are both uh, Fitchburg High graduates, both from the uh, Ray Cazenza School of Coaching uh, over at, at Crocker Field. And, and maybe most interesting historically, and this is something that dawned on me, 
to my knowledge, while there has been times where you had two Lemonster alums leading opposite teams in this rivalry, I do believe this will be the first time you will have two Fitchburg alums leading the opposite teams in this rivalry. So an interesting oh. note as well, uh, as you uh, as you look at obviously matching up against a, a former teammate. Uh, tell me what what's in your uh, what's going through your head right now about matching up with Coach Graham. No, I, I think it's gonna be great. I have a lot of respect for Greg, and you know he's you know paid his dues a lot of years helping out with the youth programs and now has been on staff there for I think about seven years and uh you know he he does a lot for the kids and he, he's a great players coach um you know and, and uh you know I think the kids respect him I think they respect him a lot and I um uh, you know and you know I know I do and when I, when I play with Greg when you know he when I was a sophomore uh and I always admired the way that he played the game then and you know admire the way he coaches now so um but he's going to be the hard nosed, tough coach. They're going to come at you offensively and they're going to come and try to pound the ball at us, I think. And, you know, with a back like Anthony, Nando, you know, I would, would expect nothing less than a healthy dose of him for the whole entire time. Um, so, you know, th that's what we really know about Fitchburg. And I know that Greg, you know, really did a great job through, you know, Rick Kazenza system and offense. And I know that he's talked about, you know, wanting to, to do some of that stuff as well too. And, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. He is not the only coach that you have familiarity with uh, on the on the staff. Uh, there's a number of them, including some that, that left your staff from last year uh, in order for an opportunity to uh, come on this new Red Raiders staff. Uh, how do you suspect, uh, you know, given the familiarity, when you get to work with people who you have a lot of common threads with, uh, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like playing cards and knowing what the other holds. Uh, yeah. How does that, in a lot of ways, how does that change your planning? I mean, it doesn't really change our, our planning much at all. I, I mean, I, when some of this stuff happens, I, I do enough changing every year in terms of signology and stuff where it doesn't, you know, it's not highly effective, you know, the, you know, the, our players aren't going to be thrown off by it, but you know, anybody who's looking to try to like get a hold of signals and stuff like that, who may know what we do, um, you know, it, it not to, not to really know what we're doing. So um, in terms of preparation, I, you know, I, it is what it is. I, I, I you know, have ways that I'm going to do things that I'm not going to change because I, you know, right or wrong, I believe it was the right way to do it. Um, you know, we're going to stay doing it that way. Um, but yeah, Lopez is the offensive coordinator over there now. He's a good coach. He he was here last year, Lemister, and helped out with the defensive backs and in the JV team and the quarterbacks. And um, now he got an opportunity to be the offensive coordinator there, and he played for me at Fitchburg State as well. Uh, their line coach, Max Schiavone, played for me at, at Fitchburg State as well. And the defensive coordinator I graduated with, Gennaro Hall, also played with James McCall, too. So it's, uh, you know, I, I, I know all those guys pretty well. I've known them for some time. And, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're in good hands at Fitchburg. Those, those are some good coaches and some good players with, you know, with the, you know, the right mindset um, to you know, to, to, to teach the kids and, and to have the kids grow and what the program needs. So, um, you know, it's it, at some point, the familiarity, it just, it can't, you know, it is, like I said, it is what it is. Um, you know, I'm not overly worried about it. You, uh, you had alluded to it last week. The, uh, the coaching tree is strangely interwoven uh, in so many ways. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the interweaves only continue uh, under these circumstances. I'll ask you, I guess, for a little bit of perspective here, though. Uh, it has got to speak volumes to the experience you all had playing under Ray Cazenza and his coaching staff, that there is such a volume of you that have turned around and decided that now becoming coaches is a step that you want to take. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they would tell you the same thing too, that he had, you know, a profound effect on us as, as young men, as, as players. And, you know, now as we coach, and it's, it, it was such a great time in our lives and we got so much out of it um, that, you know, for me, at least, like I don't feel whole unless I am coaching or I am being a part of it, you know, and that's something that I got from, from being a part of the, of, of that program. And, and, you know, during that time, and I'm sure Greg would tell you the same thing and same thing with James and Gennaro too. Uh, you know, lucky to play at, you know, at, at Fitchburg at a time where, where coach Cazenza was there and we had a lot of success. So, uh, you know, it, it's really, again, made a huge impact on us and we're, you know, at least I'm hoping here too, that we can, you know, get to that point where, 
you know, our guys are saying that about our football program when they get, you know, when they graduate and get on down the road that, you know, that they were, they were happy to play here and it made a profound effect on them. Cause that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's as coaches, what we're in it for, right. To, to give the best experience to the kids that we absolutely can uh, and to help grow the love of the game too. And that is the ultimate of compliments uh, to, uh, to hear that they wanted to continue on because of an experience that they had uh, as part of a program. So certainly something worth working toward. Uh, you alluded to this a few moments ago, Coach, but let's let's just hit on him a little bit. Monty Graham returns at, at quarterback, uh, so we know kind of what you're getting there. You know that you're getting a fantastic running attack. Anthony Equendo will be the name that everyone will jump off the page with, but he's not the only running back. Uh, they have a number of others that are returning as well as well as the ability to be physical up front. On the offensive side of the football, Fitchburg makes a really heavy case uh, to go up against your defense. What do you foresee there in that battle? You know, I'm, I'm sure that they're looking forward to the chance to go up against our defense, um, you know, especially after last year when they, you know, they weren't able to score at all. I think they want to come out and put their obviously and you know they have some big guys up front, um, you know, with Gio Long and and Stan Faulkner and um you know, I get the Mazius Newton, who's going to be, I think, one of their fullbacks too. Is you know they're trying to pound us and, and try to do, you know, the same thing that maybe Shepherd Hill did and try to pound us down the field. And you know, I think that's where the benefit of playing Shepherd Hill comes into play because you know we've played a very physical team that is downhill at us all game long. Um, so if there's any game that we're going to play that's going to prepare us for Fitchburg's size, their athleticism, their um, their strength, it's going to be Shepherd Hill. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, in Monty Graham, I can't say enough about Monty Graham. The kid, the kid is, is tough as nails after, you know, the Thanksgiving uh, Thanksgiving Day game last year. And, um, you know, he, he took a lot of hits and coming and he was basically, you know, you know, him and Devin Barrasano, one of the backup running backs, were, you know, basically the offense for the most part. And, and you know, Monty hung in there, played hard, right? Last whistle. And, you know, he's, he's a great kid. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to the competition. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a great battle. They have a lot of great players on their side and uh, I, I couldn't be happier with the players that we have on our side. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, play any, any game, any day with those guys. So um, it's going to be exciting. And here comes that opportunity in week two of the season coach 139th meeting of Lemonster and Fitchburg is on deck for this week. And of course, the broadcast information for the folks that can't be there uh, goes like this. Our special countdown to kickoff begins at 6 p.m. on the K-Zone. That's AM 1280, 105.3 FM and WPKZStream.com. Kickoff will follow at 7 p.m. on Friday night. Our partners at Lemonster TV are also partnering with FATV. So the interweave of media is uh, the ultimate. So Lemonster TV and FATV will pull their camera coverage on this one, along with replays and the Rivalry play-by-play -play coverage coming from the K-Zone all together in one fused broadcast available on Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 32 in the city of Lemonster, as well as Lemonster.tv streaming worldwide on the internet. So lots of ways to be a part of this one. Find your way to connect with this. Always the game that each and every year people are looking forward to seeing on the docket. Chance to see it again coming up this Friday night. While we're at it on the uh, on the promotional front, more live volleyball comes your way this week on facebook.com slash media rivalry. That's Wednesday, March the 25th at 515. Lemonster plays host to Hudson. Our coverage will begin at 515 on Rivalry Family Media. The first serve of that one starts at 530 for Hudson and Lemonster Volleyball. And of course, next Monday's edition of the Coach's Corner on Rivalry Family Media, 730 on Monday night, March the 29th. Coach, always a pleasure. Look forward to talking to you again next week. And we thank all of you so very much for being a part of this one. Join us for volleyball on Wednesday and the 139th meeting of Lemonster and Fitchburg on Friday. Until next week on Monday when it's the Coach's Corner, I am Todd Robbins. So long, everybody.